Now this morning we want to just take a little time to consider the opening part of this uh, second chapter of First Kings, a chapter that brings us into transition between the kingly rule of David and uh, the rule of Solomon, who of course is uh, appointed and anointed king in David's place. In the early part of the chapter, we see David, as it were, conferring and confirming the blessings of rule under the hand of God, ensuring that in his last will and testament to Solomon, Solomon is clear in his understanding of the role he must fulfill and the purpose that he must accomplish. You will see in verse 2 these words of David, I go the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore, and prove yourself a man. Our theme this morning, timely as it is in this our day and age, is simply, would the real men please stand up? We're going to look at that in these next few moments. And could I just take a moment to say that if you are tuning in for the first time this morning, or you have perhaps picked up one or two previous messages in this series, you will find all of them at your disposal on our church website. Do feel free to connect with us there. And our web page, uh, Ride Congregational dot church will take you into YouTube and you'll be able to see the services as well as hear them being preached. We would love to have your fellowship. Now here in this second chapter as we begin to move towards what will become in essence the, the main thrust of this uh, section that takes us right through um, the rule of King Solomon. We want to to notice uh, that there is a responsibility attached to the challenge of being the people of God in a godless world, a godless environment. I think I mentioned to you some time ago that when I was in the church up in Queensland, I had the opportunity and the privilege of going along to speak at an assembly at uh, one of the major boys' grammar schools in the area. Uh, Some 800 boys attended the school, and uh, we happened to have the head of the maths department attending the church at Raceview. And uh, he uh, uh, asked if I would be prepared to come along and speak at assembly. And uh, I assured him I'd be very pleased to do so until he told me that I had to say it all in 10 minutes. And then my next question was, well, which year do you want me to come? Uh, Every assembly through the year would probably... But I turned up at the assembly, having been pre-warned that we would have to be properly attired, as uh, the assembly began with a procession, uh, with all the teachers coming in to take their position uh, on the platform. And we had to wear a gown and a hood and all of those uh, regalia which uh, I have hanging up in a wardrobe and probably err about once every 15 years or so. But uh, it had to come out for that occasion. And we all assembled in the the playground or the yard outside the assembly hall, and all the boys were uh, ushered in, put into their position, and then at a given uh, moment, there was a bell went off, the boys all stood, and then we paraded in 
and took our position on the platform with the excess teachers lining up all down the edge of the hall to make sure that nobody misbehaved during the assembly. We went through all the official proceedings and then it came to uh, the time for me to give the little devotional to the boys. And God had laid upon my heart to uh, bring to them this challenge in 1 Kings 2. The verses we're going to be looking at this morning. And I'm very glad that you have allowed me more than 10 minutes to, uh, to bring this thought this morning. But um, here in verse 2 is the challenge. Prove yourself a man. 800 young boys preparing for manhood. Uh, as um, I came to the podium and uh, was introduced, I then asked if we could have a little prayer before uh, I began the, the message. And uh, as I stood there, it was almost as though a storm had suddenly erupted and blew through uh, the entire hall. As every head, 800 boys at the one time all bent forward in their seats to bow in prayer. And it was almost one of those moments where you begin to look around to see if the building is shaking. You know, we had the sound of the rushing mighty wind, but there was no shaking of the building. But as we began to address this particular theme and, and subject, uh, God opened up uh, to us the challenge that I firmly believe is more relevant and pertinent and needful for this time in this our day and generation. Where are the men? We're going to be just looking at that question uh, as we go through these opening chapters. Now look at the urgency of the question. Look at the need of the hour. History is uh, at a pivotal point. The book of Kings is a book of history. It blends with Samuel and Chronicles uh, and it, it combines to give us an outline of how God is dealing with his people, building up his kingdom and establishing his word and his work in the nation of Israel. There are those times where there is an ebb and flow, where truth prevails and then where truth suffers, where justice is seen to be done and where justice lies fallen in the street. It would appear that we have reached a similar passage of time in this our day when we are at a pivotal point in the government of our nation and therefore our future as a nation. Whether we exalt the Lord in the daily routine of our social uh, life and all that is involved, or whether we turn away from God's laws, from God's word, and seek a non-disciplined path to take us into the future. King David knows <clears throat> that his time is running out. Soon he must die. But the work is not complete. The task remains unfinished. He must now prepare to hand over the reins of rule to his son <clears throat> Solomon. There have been the repercussions of his wayward son Adonijah who attempted to abort the theme of God's purpose to turn the nation aside into another course, another path. But that has been remedied. That has been rescued. So now, in order to fill in the gaps, in order to 
secure the decision that has been made in the appointment of Solomon, the one whom God has already set apart for rule and leadership. Now Solomon must be advised and must be uh, brought into the confirmation of how he will continue to do the will of God as king of the people. So Solomon the boy must become Solomon the man. He is a young lad of some 19, possibly uh, into his uh, 20th year, but he is just a young man who has had the experience of being alongside his father in the courts of royalty, but he has not yet had the opportunity nor the necessity of setting himself up and putting his own stamp upon his future and that of the nation. So King David, in verse 1, knowing that he is about to die, summons Solomon to come and listen to this final charge. And in verse 2, he sets it out. Be strong, therefore, and prove yourself a man, and keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, and his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you turn. And here is the undergirding principle that demands the action of obedience. Look at verse 4. That the Lord may fulfill his word. God has already declared his promise. Solomon must now comply with, he must now observe and obey the word of God's promise in order to see the effects, to receive the benefit, to enjoy the blessing of what God has promised. David sets out in these opening ten verses two ways in which David passes on and Solomon must embrace the responsibilities of kingly leadership. You will note in verses 1 to 4, and this is where we want to concentrate our thoughts this morning, you will see he deals, first of all, with personal responsibilities. And then in verse 5 through to verse 9, we see he deals with professional responsibilities. You see, before we can honor God in our daily routine, we must first come to terms with the rule of God in our personal lives. So it is as we are, so will our experience and our uh, reputation be in the community that we represent. Now David, as king, was uh, fully aware that Solomon's benefit and blessing to the nation over which he will now rule would largely be in proportion to his personal relationship with God. David had proved that in his rule, in his lifetime. 
he now wants to pass on that wisdom to Solomon. As we are in our relationship to God, we will be in our relationship to others. Now, there is no doubt that Solomon needed to be guided in the proper direction. First Chronicles chapter 29, come and have a little look at what David has to say. First Chronicles chapter 29, I will often uh, have uh, parents come to me asking for their child to be done. And I have a very real um, desire to say to them, uh, what, what are we doing, putting them in the oven? <laughs> they want the child done. And, and when I begin to question them about their faith, they will say, well, we're not really terribly religious ourselves, but we just want the, the child to grow up, uh, and then you know, when they come to, to an age, they, they can make up their own mind. And then my next question is, well, what are you going to do to help encourage them in making up their own mind? Because as parents dedicating their child, there is need for a responsible approach to how our children are brought up. We promise to bring them up in the fear, the admonition, and discipline of the Lord. We can't do that if we're not a good example to them. We can't tell them, you do what I say, but ignore what I do. That doesn't work with a child. There has to be that uh, that daily example. Uh, and, and the best thing to encourage a child to make the right decision is for you as a parent to make the right decision. That's the best thing you can do for your child. But here is uh, King David, and notice what he says about Solomon. Furthermore, King David said to all the assembly, My son Solomon, whom alone God has chosen is young and inexperienced. And the work is great <clears throat> because the temple is not for man, but for the Lord God. So here is David acknowledging that the path that is laid out for Solomon has been chosen by God. And even though Solomon is young and inexperienced. David knows that the best thing he can do for Solomon is to make sure he learns obedience to the will of God. That is why in 1 Kings chapter 2 and verse 3, David brings the charge. Keep the charge of the Lord your God. It is not a matter of this is what I want you to do. This is what I want you to be. I have set out your career and I want to encourage you in every way I can to be what I want you to be. Sadly, some parents have ruined the lives of their children by trying to force them into a pattern and into a position that God does not want them to fulfill. David is wise enough to know that if Solomon is to succeed, then Solomon must obey the charge that God lays upon him. He must honor and observe God's will prior to any other. And so the instruction in 1 Kings chapter 2 becomes an exhortation. Let's just note briefly how this uh, is brought out. Look at verse 2. Verse 2 begins with the challenge, 
Be strong. That's the first thing. Be strong. Notice the second. Prove yourself a man. Can I just um, interject here a little thought for a moment, and I'm sure that um, you won't take me uh, wrong when I say this. The Bible does say that bodily exercise profits little. So it does, it does give a little advantage. But can I just say that spending hours every day in the gym to build up muscles will never turn a boy into a man. That seems to be the criteria for today. We need to look impressive in order to be impressive. That's not what David is exhorting young Solomon here to do. Prove yourself to be a man. And you won't find that in the normal ways of, uh, of the world. We need, to, we need to demonstrate a power, an authority, a strength that comes from within. But more of that as we go through uh, these verses. So, the first thing is be strong. Second, prove yourself a man. And third, in the first part of verse 3, and keep the charge of the Lord your God. Now, let's put this into perspective, and we'll reverse the order in order to understand what David is saying. In order to keep the charge of God, you must prove yourself a man. In order to prove yourself a man, you must be strong. You see the flow? Be strong. Prove yourself. And obey the charge of God. But if you're not strong to begin with, how are you going to prove yourself? How are you going to be able to obey the charge of God. So you ask, well, how do we become strong? And I know you may say, in my place of employment, you have to be strong because they will just overwhelm you so easily and so readily and sometimes even so aggressively that you can be swallowed up by the force of their antagonism against the things of God. And if we're going to stand in this world, we have to be strong. But how can we be strong in this kind of environment? Well, come over with me to Ephesians chapter 6. There are many texts that we could refer to, but I want to just leave you with this, uh, with this one. Ephesians chapter 6 in verses 10 down through to verse 19 we have that lovely passage where Paul sets out very clearly the adornment of the people of God. No fancy garments. No Easter bonnets. But the servant of God must never leave home without first putting on the armor of God. We're not engaged in a party. We're not involved in a fanfare. We are engaged in a battle, a warfare. And what do you need to go to war in and with? You need good protection. You need armor. The armor that the church can provide? No, that won't uh, satisfy in the battlefield. 
The armor that you make up for yourself, no, that will not cover you. The only armor that protects the saint is the armor that God has provided. And here in this chapter 6 of Ephesians, Paul clearly identifies how that fits, how it connects, little by little, bit by bit, so that with no peace missing, we are fully clothed, fully protected by the armor of God. <clears throat> but you can put on armor and sit at home. And all that happens is you get very warm when the fire's on. It serves no other purpose. Armor is for the battlefield. So how can we approach the battlefield even knowing that we are clothed with all the armor of God? Look at verse 10. Finally, my brethren. Paul, not quite at the same stage that David is at, but Paul is getting close. And Paul knows that Timothy and Titus and Barnabas and Silas and others who are coming after him will also need to receive the charge of God. And here is what Paul says. Put on the whole armor of God. Verse 11. But before you do, verse 10, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. They that wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength. They shall Mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. You see, it's in the waiting that we are able to fly and to run and to walk. Often we try to walk, run and fly without waiting upon God. And then we wonder why our strength ebbs and we begin to fail. You see, Paul is here reminding us in Ephesians 6 verse 10 that we are strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. So here is the thought. David said to young Solomon, 1 Kings 2 and verse 2. I go the way of all the earth. Be strong, therefore. How can he be strong? He can be strong in the Lord. That is why when the challenge then comes to observe the commandments and the testimonies and the statutes and the laws of God, they don't come across as being burdensome. In actual fact, they allow Solomon to demonstrate or to prove that his strength is not in his heritage. His strength is not in his position as king upon the throne. But his strength is in the resilience of his faith as he learns to walk in obedience to the will of God. Keep the charge. If I'm going to keep the charge, then I must be strong in the Lord. Look again at verse 3. There's an interesting translation <clears throat> of this uh, first part of the text which indicates that in the original Hebrew, the thought there is, 
uh, keep the charge of the Lord. It has built in the thought, keep the charge or keep the keeping. Keep the keeping. What does 1 Peter 1 verse 3 to 5 tell us? Well, let, let's just go over to 1 Peter 1 and uh, look at verses 3, 4, and 5. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled, and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you. Now, who does the reserving? You go and you take your wealth to the bank and you put it in a deposit and you ask the bank to look after it on your behalf. Who is looking after our inheritance? It's a good thing it's not you and it's not me. God has reserved it. He will preserve it. And when the time comes and we retire from this old world with all its woes, not only will we enter into the joy of the Lord, but we'll enter into our inheritance the inheritance that he has determined we will need for all eternity. We don't need to worry about a thing. And here we read, to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are kept by the power of of God. So if we are kept by the power of God, what is God doing? God is keeping. He is doing the keeping. We are the kept of God. That's why nothing will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus because God is doing the keeping. Now, what about this charge? Well, you'll find that the charge that David now gives to Solomon is not a new charge. In fact, it's to be found all throughout the Scriptures, both the Old and New Testament. Come, for example, to Genesis 26. Genesis 26. Let's look at verses 1 to 5. <clears throat> there was a famine in the land beside the first famine that was in the days of Abraham. And Isaac went to Abimelech, king of the Philistines in Gerar, then the Lord appeared to him and said, Do not go down to Egypt. Live in the land of which I shall tell you. You see, famines come and famines go. We are quite possibly entering into a time of famine. The Bible tells us that in the last days there will be a famine, not for food, or drink, but a famine for the Word of God. There will be those who will desire to hear it, and it will not be found. How many sit in church today expecting to hear a word from the Lord, and they're being fed the skim milk 
the buttermilk, not the pure milk of the Word. They're not being fed on sound, solid meat. They're not growing. They're not developing. They're not maturing. And they go out into the world and they're not strong. They're anemic. They're weak. And the devil comes with subtle temptations and they fall because they're not being fed. But here we read, the Lord said to Abraham, dwell in this land and I will be with you and bless you. You see, that's what God does for his people in the time of famine. Others may be perishing, but God's people will thrive even in the midst of hardship. Why? Because God has already determined. He has pledged his word and he will keep his promise. Let's read a little more. Dwell in this land and I will be with you and bless you for to you and your descendants I give all these lands and I will perform the oath which I swore to Abraham your father. And I will make your descendants multiply as the stars of heaven. I will give to your descendants all these lands, and in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. Note, because Abraham obeyed my voice and kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. You may well leave church this morning and uh, prepare for work tomorrow and go in and someone will come and speak to you and ask you where you were yesterday. And you'll say, well, I was in church. And the minister said this. And that will be good. At least I hope it will be good. But the bottom line is this. You are not to go out and serve God on the basis of what I tell you. You are to search the Scriptures and go to war and to work on the basis of the charge that God has given to you. You will note that Abraham kept the charge and it comes up in three forms. My commandments, my statutes, and my laws. Now come over into Deuteronomy chapter 5. And there are others, but we'll just limit our thoughts to these this morning. Deuteronomy chapter 5 and uh, verse 31. Deuteronomy 5 verse 31. But as for you, stand here by me, and I will speak to you all the commandments, the statutes, and the judgments which you shall teach them, that they may observe them in the land which I am giving them to possess. God now challenges Moses. So God challenged Abraham. Now Moses, and then come over into chapter 8 and verse 11. Beware that you do not forget the Lord your God by not keeping his commandments, his judgments, and his statutes, which I command you today. These were the conditions for the full enjoyment of the land that God had promised them. In possession of the land, if they were to enjoy the full benefits of being under the rule of God, then they had to observe these three things, the commandments and the testimonies or statutes and the laws. 
Now, how did the people of Israel know what these were? Well, we have, <clears throat> first of all, the moral law. You'll find that in the Ten Commandments, the Decalogue, God's moral law. Secondly, you'll find it in the judicial law. Reading through the first five books of the Old Testament, the books of Moses, the Pentateuch, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. You'll see there the laws that God uh, brings to bear upon the lives of his people as they establish a rule of disciplined government. How they behave with one another. How they treat the nations round about. These were the judicial laws. And then thirdly, you have the ceremonial laws. These were the laws of the Levites. And they center around worship. Who God is. How God can be observed and worshipped. The altar, the sacrifices, the rituals, the ceremonies. And God is insisting upon his people that they carry this with them, not only in their outward conformity, but in the inner conviction of their heart. That was the charge. Now we look around us and we see in our times that all of these rules of God have been challenged and broken. Where do we stand in relation to the moral laws of God? To the judicial laws of God? To the ceremonial laws of God? We have abandoned them as a nation. We have cast them out. And so what has God said to our heart this morning? You and I need to stand up. We need to be strong. We need to prove ourselves to be men. We need to adopt the attitude of non-conformity to the world and the things of the world if we are to live our lives according to the will of God. Here in 1 Kings chapter 2, verses 3 and 4, you'll see how David sets it out for Solomon. Keep the charge of the Lord your God to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his judgments, his testimonies, as it is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do and wherever you you turn. Five things. Walk in his ways. Keep his statutes. Keep his commandments. Keep his judgments. Keep his testimonies. How? As it is written in the law of Moses. You see, God hasn't changed the challenge. God does not adapt to the environment of the world as it changes. There are many who will say that it does and who will admonish us for not trying to move along with the times. You've got to keep up. You've got to be contemporary. But God doesn't change his word. He doesn't suddenly bring out a new scripture in order to make the adjustments necessary to make his gospel palliative to the world. God gives us his word and this word is eternal and you and I must live according to it. Not according to the world. Now how does the New Testament uh, bring this through? Let me just conclude with one or two texts. Come over into First uh, John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2. The little epistles at the back of your book, just tucked in before uh, the main book of Revelation. First 
First and Second Peter, First, Second, Third John, Jude, Revelation. We want to turn to First John two, verses three to six. Now by this we know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He who says, I know him, and does not keep his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. See, that's the assurance. That's the sign. How do I know that I am in the elect of God? Is it presumption for me to confess my faith and to indicate that I firmly believe that I am in the kingdom, that I am a child of God? On what grounds can I have that assurance? Here we're told, Whoever keeps his word, truly the love of God is perfected in him. By this we know that we are in him. If I would rather be persecuted or oppressed, cast down or cast out, if I know that in my heart in order to be pleasant, pleasing, or popular in the world, I have to compromise the Word of God. If there is something in my heart that challenges me with a conviction that come what may, I cannot compromise the Scriptures, then that becomes a sign, a sealing of the covenant of God that I am His and He is mine. But if I go out and play the world, if I go out and sing along to its music and dance to its melody and follow through on all that the world would suggest is there for my pleasure and entertainment, when all the time I know that I'm compromising what I believe, I'm going against the Scriptures, I am casting a slur upon the very name of Christ, and yet I'm prepared to keep on doing it, then I know in my heart that I cannot truly be a child of God. There's no evidence there. There's no conviction there. And we will never ever be converted. We'll never ever be saved. We'll never ever be in heaven on the strength of a profession. We will only be in heaven on the assurance of a possession. God in us. So John tells us very clearly, let's go to chapter 3 and uh, look at verses 4 through to 10. Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose the Son of God was manifested that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin for his seed remains in him. That is, God's seed remains in him. And he cannot sin because he has been born of God. In this the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness, is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. Then down to verse 24. Now he who keeps his commandments abides in him, and he in him. And by this we know that he abides in us 
by the Spirit whom He has given us. So here is the charge. It hasn't changed. It hasn't been altered. It has not been lifted. We can find no excuse for denying God and living according to the standards of the world. But rather, if we are the children of God, then the time has come for us to stand up and prove that we are the children of God. In order to do that, we must be fully committed to His will and know His strength in us. Now, it would have been easy for Solomon to simply say, that's okay, I will follow that rule of authority, and I'll accept the charge, and I'll seek to walk in God's will. But in order for Solomon to prove that he was in that position, he had to begin (coughs) to make the hard yards. And that's when we come in, God willing, in our next study, we'll come into this theme of how he must now take the challenge that is personal and apply it in his professional life. And that means making some very hard decisions. It means sorting out the problems of the past and holding people accountable. It means establishing a government that will see to the safety and security of the nation. Because after all, this is not just a nation that is in danger of falling apart. This is not just a nation that is in danger of being defeated by her enemies. But this is a nation of people that are in danger of walking away from the blessing of God. And so everything has to be done in order to try and secure the principles of righteousness. And if that means dealing with sin, then sin must be dealt with. And God willing, we'll take that thought up in our next study. Let's unite our hearts this morning as we conclude with prayer. Our loving Father, we gather in these moments as uh, in our heart we contemplate the truth of your word. We sense that you have brought us to a solemn moment when we are challenged in relation to our responsibility to the charge of God. We often like to have things our own way, but sometimes that is not what's best for us. And we know that we can so easily be deceived into accepting and following the lure of a lesser loyalty and pleasing ourselves rather than pleasing you. And in the end, we suffer because we forfeit the blessing of God. But Lord, you know our heart today and as we have your enabling and as we fully depend upon your grace, we confess, as did Solomon, that it is our desire to follow you, to prove that we are your people. And so we ask for your forgiveness for all our shortcomings and our sin for all our transgressions, our iniquities, for all our weaknesses, our faults, and our fears. And we pray that with the covering of the blood of Jesus, with the cleansing and the purifying of that finished work of Christ on Calvary's cross, we may also know the imparting of power by the Holy Spirit, so that we will be strong in the power of your might. 
And this we pray in our Saviour's name. Amen.